Hi, my name is Martin. Hi, my name is Carola. And uh, welcome to another instance of our series with uh, computational geometry concept videos uh, in which we take a geometric concept and dive into its history, complexity, definition and other interesting properties. Today's concept is the smallest enclosing circle. New Orleans is well known for its high quality roads. In path planning it is important to avoid obstacles such as these holes. Um, however, storing the exact geometry of every single hole in the entire city would be a little bit expensive and it's also not really necessary. Instead we could approximate every hole by a different and simpler shape, such as a circle. Now, it is of course important that every circle completely covers each hole, but we also don't want them to be any larger than they need to be, since that would constrain our options. So there's a geometric problem hiding here. Given a hole, or a small set of holes, how do we find the smallest circle that completely encloses them? We're given a set of sites, let's call it S, and let's say our sites live in the two-dimensional Euclidean plane, so in R2, and let's say we have N of such sites. Now the smallest enclosing circle of S is just that, it's the smallest circle that encloses, that means contains, all the sites in S. In other words, it's the circle with a radius that is the minimum of all the radii of circles that contain all the sites in S. So, how do we calculate the smallest enclosing circle? Well, the definition we just saw is very simple, but not very constructive, um, because the set of circles that we're minimizing over is an infinite set. So, this actually doesn't immediately give us any algorithm to compute it. So to find an algorithm, we're going to have to do a little geometry. One observation that we can make is that even though there is an infinite number of circles, uh, we don't need to consider all of them, because, well, those circles that do not contain any sides of S on their boundary are not going to be the smallest enclosing circle. So why? Because I can make it smaller. I can just tighten it a little bit. And as I tighten it, it still doesn't have any points on its boundary. And I can actually keep doing this until it hits one of those points. And now it has one point on the boundary. So really, we only need to consider those circles which have at least one side of S on their boundary. So at this point you might be wondering, well, how can a circle that contains all sites in its interior actually have any sites on its boundary. Uh, well, that's a sort of tricky matter, uh, but for the purposes of this video, we'll just say that sites on a boundary are counted as being inside. Okay, so now we only need to consider those circles which have at least one site on their boundary. Problem is, there's still an infinite number of circles like that. Uh, so what did we gain here? Well, actually, we can use the same argument as before. Now there's only one point on the boundary, and we can keep still tightening the circle, actually keeping this point fixed. We can still make the circle smaller. And as we keep making it smaller, eventually we'll hit a second point. Now there's two points on the boundary of the circle. So, by the same argument, we now know that we only have to consider circles which have at least two sides on their boundary. And in fact, in this case, we can tighten it even a little more until we have three points all touching the circle. And now we cannot make it any smaller anymore. And in fact, the actual smallest enclosing circle of S is always uh, either a circle with two sides or a circle with three sides on its boundary. 
the smallest enclosing circle is always defined by either two or three points on the boundary. So for example, in a configuration like this, there are three points all on the boundary of the circle and we actually cannot tighten it anymore because, well, the circle cannot get smaller. If I would try to tighten it more, it would no longer be a circle. Uh, so that's one case. The other case is that there's two points on the boundary of the circle, like in a configuration like this. So here, this is also the smallest enclosing circle, but there are only two points on the boundary. Okay, so this observation now does give us an algorithm, um, because we know we only have to consider those circles which have two or three sides on their boundary, um, and, well, how many of such circles are there? Well, there's uh, n times n times n ways to choose three points, so that's n to the power three different circles. And, well, for each of them we have to check whether all the other si sides are inside, uh, so that requires, well, going over all the points, so that takes linear time. So in total that would be n to the four time to find the smallest enclosing circle. Okay, so how much is that? Well, to give some perspective, if we have 10 sides, then 10 to the power 4 is 10,000. If we have 100 sides, 100 to the power 4 is uh, 100 million. So the question still is, can we do better? Well, it's a fair, very natural concept again. So, uh, yeah, naturally people have thought about it already for a long time. Yeah, it's been around since at least the 19th century. So, uh, James Sylvester um, posed it and then right. looked at this problem. Yeah, but people yeah. must have looked at it before then. <laughs> they must have. Yeah. yeah, algorithms are a bit more recent uh, because, well, there were no computers in the 19th century, so... Uh, and, um, 1972, uh, Jack Elsimcha and Donald Hearn um, gave an algorithm for computing the uh, smallest enclosing circle, um, and that algorithm took n to the four time. So, 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 so that's 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 a, that's kind of high, right? That is kind of high, yeah. Yeah, but 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 they did notice that you know, in in practice, um, the runtime seemed to be close to linear in, in most cases. So, so sometimes you can have that, right? That, that an algorithm um, provably takes a long time on some inputs, but still on other inputs it's faster. Um, so the, the runtime of an algorithm might actually depend on the input that you feed into the algorithm. Right, exactly. And, um, and, and sometimes um, it, algorithms can work quite fast on, you know, most of the inputs, but but then there might be some like really convoluted inputs where 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 the algorithm just just runs much slower. Yeah, and maybe those convoluted inputs uh, are inputs you would not encounter in practice, so then you don't care. Anymore. Right, but that really depends, like like what one means within practice, right? Because like for one application, so those might be convoluted inputs, but for another application, those those might be perfectly normal inputs, so. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, especially when you describe an algorithm, you know, somebody in the future might use it uh, for an application that you never even thought of, and so uh, it might be important that it actually works on all possible inputs. Right. Mm -hmm. In 1975, there's the algorithm by Michael Seamus and... Uh, Dan Hui. Dan Hui. They give a, an Amalgam algorithm, I think. And in fact, they also conjectured that that's the best one can do that that one cannot be better than n log n yeah right yeah so they conjecture that in, that there exists no algorithm to solve the smallest enclosing circle with a running time faster than n log n on all possible inputs right so 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 that's a strong statement right so how can one um, know that for all possible inputs right mm -hmm. um, but in fact um, if you think about it, so, so for example, um, if you want to compute the maximum of, of a set of numbers, right, 
then that has to take at least n time for, for all possible inputs because I have to look at every number, right? So, 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 so there is a sort of simple lower bound like this, like for any possible input, computing the maximum has to take at least linear time. Right, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, but I mean, a lower bound of n log n, that's something else, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's that, that that is true. That that is something else. And um, and uh, in the seventies, mid seventies, um, people people started to look more into lower bounds for mm -hmm. for, for problems. You know, um, such as for example, um, computing or, or finding a lower bound for sorting n numbers. So there's actually an n log n lower bound for sorting n numbers. So one can prove that, that for any possible input, you know, it must take at least n log n time to sort those numbers. Um, it's not so strange that uh, Seamus and Hui also conjectured an n log n lower bound for, uh, for this geometric problem because, well, lower bounds were being found around that time. Actually, they didn't prove it because that conjecture wasn't true. Right. Yeah, there is actually a faster algorithm for computing a small synchronizing circle. Right, that was um, Nimrod Megiddo who gave that algorithm in 1983. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a linear time algorithm, um, but it has a really large hidden constant. So that's one of the things, right? So when researchers in algorithms talk about how fast algorithms are, they always talk about the order of time that an algorithm takes. So an algorithm can be like in the order of n or the order of n log n or order of n squared. Um, but this order actually means that there is uh, a constant, a hidden constant. This, this, this order really means that in the limit for large n, like um, n is, or a linear time algorithm that's a constant times n, is faster than a constant times n squared. But for small n, it might actually be that the n squared is faster than the n because of the n constant. Exactly, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like a, a million times n is also a linear time algorithm, or a trillion times n, uh, even though in practice it's clearly much slower. So, yeah. By using Megiddo's algorithm, uh, we cannot really compute the smallest increasing circle. Well, I mean, we can compute it in practice, but there is a large hidden constant, so it will still take a long time. But there's another algorithm in 91, Emo Welzel also gave a linear term algorithm that m works much faster in practice, but it's a randomized algorithm. Ah, you got his paper there, this one. <laughs> uh, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that's it. And uh, and uh, and actually, so uh, Emo did this at uh, Freie Universität Berlin, so um, that's where I got my degrees and my PhD. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. So Emo Welsel's algorithm is also linear time, but it's only linear in expectation. Randomized algorithms. They can have different runtimes um, depending on on some random randomness that, that's infused in the algorithm. So so then it might have a fast runtime, it might have a large runtime. So it's different than the uh, the algorithm by Elsinga and Bern that we talked about, mm -hmm. which also runs sometimes fast and sometimes slow. Right. But there it depends on the input, and in a randomized algorithm it doesn't depend on the input. Right. So I think that's a different. The algorithm by Imo Wetzel is not hard to describe. It's based in, on the idea of incremental construction. So we take our set of sites and incrementally insert one after the other. So we start with a small set of sites and compute the smallest enclosing circle and then we keep adding in sites and keep updating the smallest enclosing circle until we're done and have inserted all sites. So how do we do that concretely? Well, we start with the first two sites and set the current circle 
to the one that has these two sides as its diameter. Now whenever we insert a new site, we check whether it's inside or outside the current minimum and closing circle. If it's inside, we're lucky and we don't have to change anything. However, if it's outside, then we need to do some more work. We need to find the smallest enclosing circle of the sites we have seen so far. But wasn't that the problem we started with? Well, not really. We know one thing, the site we just inserted was not in the previous smallest enclosing circle. A claim that means it must be now on the new smallest enclosing circle. So let's say this happened after inserting k sites. So that means now we need to compute the smallest enclosing circle of those k sites. And we already know one of the three sites that are on the boundary of the circle. How do we find the other two? Well, essentially in the same way. We'll use another algorithm, a prime, that gives us the smallest enclosing circle if one of the sites on the optimal circle is already known. Now the main algorithm A had no site on the optimal circle known and it calls a prime multiple times, usually. And actually that algorithm A prime uses another algorithm A double prime which gives us the smallest enclosing circle uh, when two sites on the optimal circle are already known. And note that because it's a randomized algorithm, the number of times a prime calls a double prime is also random. But the trick is that it actually stops here. So while a double prime actually needs to call yet another algorithm, a triple prime that has already three sites known of the optimal circle, well, that is a trivial algorithm. We immediately return those three sites without even looking at the others. Anyway, we apply that algorithm A prime to the first k sites that we inserted in algorithm A, and that will give us the smallest enclosing circle for those k sites. And now we can insert one more point, and again, the new smallest enclosing circle has this new point on its boundary. All right, let's give it a try. an algorithm, but how much time does it take? Well, every time we insert a site, we could be unlucky and the site could be outside our current circle. That means we would need to call a subroutine where we need to insert all the sites again, but then we could get unlucky again and, and have to um, have to call another subroutine. So, so, and if we're unlucky, this could be happen for every single site. So for every site, we have to do something for every site and we have to do something for every site. So that's n times n times n doing something. So in the worst case, the algorithm takes in the order of n cubed time. That's a little better than the algorithm we started with, but not much better. So the algorithm we just described takes cubic time in the worst case. However, that really is only if we get very unlucky. But how likely is it actually that we get so unlucky? Well, the trick here is that we can insert the sites in a random order. And then, hopefully, the actual probability that we get unlucky every time is so small that this will hardly ever happen in practice. And in practice, the algorithm might actually be efficient. So an algorithm like that is what we call a randomized algorithm. And these can be a very powerful tool to get efficient algorithms in practice because, well, they might take a very long time, but the chance of that happening is very small. So there are two important things to keep in mind 
uh, when we're talking about randomized algorithms. The first property is that the algorithm should still be guaranteed to always give the correct answer 100% of the time. And the second property is that, well, the algorithm is expected to be efficient. So that means there is a chance that the algorithm takes a long time. However, that chance is very small and also importantly, that chance does not depend on the input. So what's the expected amount of time that our algorithm takes? Well, we need to know what the probability is of a site that we insert will be inside a circle. So that will take a bit of advanced mathematics to calculate and we're not going to do that here. But there's a trick. The trick is called backwards analysis. It still requires some math, but it's much more basic and it's so beautiful. Are you ready? Instead of computing the probability that the next site we insert is outside of the current circle, we could also compute the probability that the previous site we inserted was outside the previous circle. It's backwards analysis, so let's play the movie backwards. So what is that probability? Well, it's the probability that the circle changed in the previous step. So which side could have been the last side that we inserted? Well, any of the k sides, but only two or three are on the boundary and the other ones are inside. Here, n equals 7 and k equals 5. And three sides are on the boundary. So the probability that it did change is only 2 or 3 over k, so in order to give an upper bound, let's just say it's 3 over k. In our example, that's 3 over 5. And if the last site was one of the sites inside the current circle, then before we inserted that site, we had the same circle. So in other words, it didn't change. And that probability is greater or equal to k minus 3 over k, so that's 2 over 5. So let's say t of n is a function that tells us for n sites um, in expectation how long it takes to compute the smallest enclosing circle. And let's say t prime of n is, is a similar function that tells us the time that it takes to compute the smallest enclosing circle of n sites if one site is already known. Then we can write down the formula so we sum over all sites the probability that the circle did not change times a constant runtime plus the probability that it did change times the time to call algorithm A prime. So now let's assume it takes linear time to calculate the smallest enclosing circle if one side is already fixed. So t prime of n is a constant times n. We plug in c prime times k for t prime of k, then we can cancel out the k's and get a slightly nicer looking formula uh, with the sum from 1 to k equals 1 to n of k minus 3 over k times c plus 3 times c prime. Now we can manipulate this a little bit and cancel the k's and manipulate a little further and we can split the summation into two summations like this where this the summation on the right hand side this is actually at most zero so we can simplify this to just this one summation of um, k equals 1 to n with c plus 3 times c prime so that is just n times c plus 3c prime, so it's n times another constant, which means that it's linear time. All right, then why is t prime of n linear in n? Well, we can do the same kind of analysis, but this time comparing with t double prime of n, where we already know two sides on the boundary, and then in turn comparing with t triple prime of n, where we know three sides on the boundary, but then we're done, because three sides define a circle. 
So we have proven that in expectation, t of n is a constant times n. So this is a linear time algorithm. Phew, that was a bit of an argument, but isn't it just magical? I mean, the algorithm is really simple. You just, just insert one point after the other and update the smallest enclosing circle. And with a bit of clever math, it's a linear runtime in expectation. So, good news for past planners. It is possible to compute a circle that approximates a single pothole in only linear time. And given the shape of some of these holes and the sheer number of them in the city, I'd say that's actually pretty lucky. Well, you've made it to the end. Um, congratulations, uh, we hope you enjoyed it and learned something. Yeah, so today we've seen that the smallest enclosing circle can surprisingly be computed in linear time by using a very simple algorithm um, with a complicated analysis. And if you want to know more, we've put all of our sources and materials in the description below. Yeah, thanks a lot for watching.